Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing another episode of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. Today will be part 92, so lots and lots of interesting mods that we've covered and we're going to cover in this part of 92. So we have a, lots, a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk about some of the wild biodiversity that we share our world with. And today we've got pretty much no fish this time. Mainly just a couple birds and mostly mammals, so I know you guys will be very happy if you guys like your mammals and young ulets and things like that. A few primates, you guys will be very, very happy with this episode. Um, so we're going to be starting off now. So this is Leaf and Jen, a wonderful duo, making um, some birds for us. We'll be starting off here with the Black Crowned Crane. So a very close relative as the grey crown crane that I covered a couple episodes ago. But you can see the main differences here is that they're a lot more blackish in colour, of course. So that's kind of where they get their name. So these guys can measure up to about 105 centimetres or 3 feet 5 inches in length. And they weigh between uh, 3,400 grams or 3 to 4 kilograms or 6 to 8 pounds. We'll have one walking around as we wait. Um, yeah, and they have a wingspan about 180 to 200 centimeters or 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 7 And naturally you can see they have this quite dark plumage which really sets it apart from the grey crown crane And they also have these big bristles of like a grey crown where they get that name the grey crown um, Black crown very similar to that other distinctive features they have is that they got these white feathers under their wings They've also got this small patch of red skin on the gula sack around under their uh, chin there. A little bit of a white patch there as well. These bright blue eyes, of course, really gives them an interesting look. And um, there are some differences between the two subspecies, the West African Black Crowned and the um, Sudan Black Crowned. Uh, some slight differences there, but these guys are just subspecies, so they're not too different from each other, but still really wonderful looking. Let's see if we can find one over here walking around really really beautiful animals here so these guys they live in the sahal and sudan regions uh, of africa around the savannas so they occupy areas uh, such as grasslands shallow wetlands marshes and margins of lakes and rivers when they're also known to root uh, um, roost in trees and their range typically extends from sengal down to um Burkina um, Guinea uh, drainage through West Africa to the Ethiopian Highlands and the southwestern Rift Valley in East Africa with the um, Obviously the two subspecies living in different parts of their range like the West African uh, And then the Sudan region and the other one living in it obviously kind of it tells in the name of the subspecies the Sudan living in the Sudanese areas and stuff like that but um yeah in terms of vocalizations these guys make low pitched uh, honks or mellows or stuff like that in terms of vocalization and in terms of their diet they tend to be generalist feeders so they tend to feed on insects such as grasshoppers insects um, uh, flies uh, centipedes, millipedes, other invertebrates like mollusks, crustaceans. They'll also eat fish, amphibians, and small reptiles. So typically they're most resident in wetlands except during the dry season and they will sometimes forage in short to dry grass or in upland areas with livestock where the insect numbers are high. And the black crown crane is actually may forage in croplands as well, as well and feed on chickpeas, lentils, uh, corn, rice, stuff like that. But they will seldom dig for food, but uh, would rather peck it off surfaces. And as an alternate to digging, they might stomp their feet to disturb and reveal insects that might be in the soil, which is pretty cool. So in terms of breeding, let's see if we can get a look at this little baby here. How cute is he? So in terms of breeding, uh, they typically breed through um, May to December in the West African Black Crane and the Sudan Black Crown Crane. They typically breed from July to January. So the margins of these breeding times is wide as breeding success is dependent on the wet and dry seasons and the suitability of the environment. So black crown cranes will peak, uh, numbers will peak during the dry season and flocks may actually include several hundred individuals. So they'll gather in this way uh, before the next breeding season commences, which allows the juvenile cranes to merge with other young flocks uh, that have not reached the full first breeding age of about three to five years old. And in the breeding season, black cranes usually have, can be found in pairs, but are observed in groups that have been up to about 20 or so individuals. So typically these nests, with the base being about 69 to 109 millimeters or 71 to 140 millimeters in diameter, uh, the base of it, uh, are built with, uh, within or on the edges of dense woodlands and are constructed in like sedges and grasses with a circular platform. 
Due to their op uh, opportunistic nature regarding food availability and shelter, these black crown cranes may actually alter their nesting sites according to the season. And clutch sizes are usually made up between one and three eggs, uh, which are about uh, 222 to 168 grams in mass. And incubation for these eggs will be performed by both the male and female, and this will last for about uh, 28 to 31 days. And males are known to stand guard by the nests for nearby trees and prepare to single a threat as the female forages. And chicks uh, will forage with their parents in grass and areas a day after hatching. And typically they fledge at about 60 to 100 days. And then that's when they're big enough and ugly enough to fly around do their own thing and get their wings. So um, in terms of the conservation status, uh, these guys are not quite as endangered as the grey crown crane, but they're still considered vulnerable with an estimated population of about 28,000 to 47,000 individuals remaining. They face very big threats such as the degradation of their wetland habitats, which is their primary breeding, feeding and roosting sites. Um, increases in doubts and droughts and draining of wetlands uh, in the name of farming. Also construction on dams and other irrigation things have really affected the wetlands as well. And for th furthermore, Fragmented wetlands result in the restricted movement of aquatic mammals that limits the food availability for these cranes and the negative effects of these have further been aggravated by hunting, capturing for the or trade of these birds which has claimed a lot of their remaining wild population. But they are considered vulnerable, there's about 50,000 or so, 20 to, uh, 40, 28 to 47,000 or so. So they are still considered uh, commonish. And the black crown crane is actually the national bird of Nigeria and is often considered a, sim a symbol of peace, which is pretty, pretty cool. Really, really awesome birds. Uh, do like talking about them. Uh, next, we've got another mod from Jen and Leaf. Uh, we have got the Eurasian Spoonbill, which is pretty awesome. So these guys are also known as the Common Spoonbill. So these guys are a wading bird in the uh, Ibis and Spoonbill family, and their name refers to like broad uh, bill and stuff like that. Uh, and they're also called the Shoveland in like England uh, and the name was later used for the Northern Shoveler which is a type of duck. Um, these guys are considered least concerned, quite a common species still. So these guys are typically like unmistakable for most of their range, people can typically tell them apart for most of the things. Their breeding birds are typically all white except for dark bands on uh, their legs. Um, uh, black bill and yellow tip with the yellow um, breast patch similar to a pelican. They also have a crest during the breeding season and non-breeders will lack the crest and breast patches and immature birds may, though immature birds may have pale bill and black tips to the primary uh, flight feathers. Though unlike herons, spoonsbills will fly with their necks outstretched and they typically differ from the African spoonbill which overlaps the habitat in the winter as the latter specifically has the uh, red legs uh, and red legs and face and no crest. So that's kind of the main way to tell between the European and African uh, spoonbill. So in terms of their habitat, these guys can be found widely across Europe, Asia and Africa, where they typically breed from the United Kingdom and Portugal in the West, locally uh, throughout the continent, ranging from Denmark to the, and the Black Sea into Asia. And they've actually been found like the Korean Peninsula as well, as, as well as Southern Iraq, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka and India. They breed locally in coastal um, Manishra, I believe you say that, and more widely across the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden coasts. And they have been known to breed in warmer parts of Europe, such as the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which are resident populations. But northern populations normally migrate south to the winter of the northern half of Africa or warm parts of Asia, so they can um, basically have a warmer place to bring up the baby uh, to survive during the winter, um, which is pretty cool. Then some northern birds do remain in their general region during the winter, including the United Kingdom as well. Kind of just depends on the individual or population. Uh, there's a lot of variation within there. And these guys also show a preference for extremely shallow, like uh, extensive shallow wetlands with muddy clay or fine east, fine sand bends. And they also inhabit many types of rivers, uh, marshes, flooded areas, mangrove swamps, whether it be fresh, saline or brackish waters. And, but especially on islands with nesting and dense emergent vegetation and scattered trees and shrubs. And they also may frequent sheltered marine habitats such as deltas, estuaries, tidal creeks and co uh, coastal lakes. So in terms of breeding, we'll have a look at these cute little guys here. Uh, most northerly breeding populations are fully migratory, but they may only migrate short distances, while others more southerly pop populations are resident 
or nomadic or partially migratory. It really just depends on population. In the Paleo-Arctic, they breed in the spring, so from April. But in tropical parts of their range, they will breed depending uh, when it's raining the most, uh, coincide with rainfall. Um, breeding is normally in single species colonies or in small single species groups. Uh, amidst mixed species colonies of other water birds such as heron, egrets and cormorants. Outside the breeding season, Eurasian spoonbills will form singly on small flocks up to 100 individuals. Migration usually is um, concluded uh, by flocks of 100 individuals or so and most actively take place during the morning and evening, though in coastal areas that goes with the tidal rhythms. And they ro uh, roost communally and in roosts up to about 15 kilometers away from their feeding zones. And you can see this cute little baby here. Isn't he adorable? So the nest platform that these guys make is typically either constructed on the ground or on islands or in lakes, or rivers, or dead stands of reeds, mangroves, or trees up to five meters off the ground. So within colonies, nests are usually quite close together, no more than uh, one or two meters apart. And breeding colonies are normally um, sited within... Uh, within 10 to 15 kilometers or 6.2 to 9.3 miles of feeding areas and often much less. Though some species, some populations may have to move up to 40 kilometers or 25 miles away to breed. Um, and you can see if they look little babies uh, to feed while they breed. Cute little babies. I really do love the color of the Eurasian spoonbill. Um, anyway, in terms of feeding, they have quite a varied diet. They can feed on aquatic insects, mollusks, newts, leeches, worms, frogs, tadpoles, small fish, crustaceans, up to about 10 to 15 centimeters long or so. But they may also take algae or small fragments of aquatic plants. And they usually s s sideways sweep their beaks to filter out the tiny shrimp and fish that they eat. So very interesting feeding uh, strategy. So in terms of their uh, population, uh, the Eurasian sp uh, spoonbill is considered least concern. And the total population was estimated to be about 63 to 65,000 individuals in 2015. And in Europe, the population has increased a significant, uh, a significant degree. Uh, the population has experienced a significant decrease. I can't speak properly between 1960 and 1990. But since then, the population has um, estimated to be number 29,000 mature birds in 2020. So they've kind of gone up. So some uh, areas such as the Netherlands, they had small populations of 150, but now they've grown back because of protection and things like that, also increasing temperatures. There have been some returning to the UK as well, and some uh, conservation projects to help them in the UK and other areas where they're more extirpated or locally um, endangered or extinct to try and bring them back and help populations there. And the threats that these guys face are typically things like habitat loss, degradation, drainage and pollution, also the dip, uh, disappearance of reed swamps things like that which causes population to decline they're also highly vulnerable to general disturbances and predators such as red foxes and colonies on islands may be actually free from these pressures but obviously disturbance is a big thing for these guys but yeah luckily they're doing quite well considered least concern uh coming back in a big way really really awesome birds also done by leaf and jen jen did a really wonderful job with these guys so next we're moving on to some mammals we've got some pretty cool gazelles going on here so we've got here the mountain gazelle so this was done by leaf and mega game and rex so these guys are one of the few mammals where actually both sexes have horns and males have significantly larger horns with rings around them but females will also have horns but they tend to be thinner and shorter as you can see this is the male here and this is the female's comparison so we'll have a look at the male here because he's the biggest and the most oppressive. Um, along with horns, the mountain gazelles are sexually dimorphic with the males being larger than the females. And the wild male can range between 17 to 29.5 kilograms, while females are about 16 to 25 kilograms in weight. And they can reach running speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour or 50 kilometers an hour. So quite a speedy bunch. So in terms of their population and range, uh, they're most abundant in places like Israel, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights, and but they can also be found in Jordan and Turkey. While there's no uh, accurate estimates on the populations of the uh, number of individuals in the wild, uh, the Israeli Parks and Nature Authority estimates there's only about 3,100 gazelles in the country and potentially less than 3,000 left in their range, which sadly makes them endangered. So... In terms of their habitats, these guys are really well adapted to living in dry, desert-like conditions. They spend most of their time on tops of mountain and hills, and living in an annual uh, average temperature of 21 to 23 degrees. They actually prefer to bed on tops of hills and mountains to avoid the heat during the day. And around drawn to dusk, these mammals uh, will be found traversing the hills at 
to eat in light uh, forest fields and desert plateaus. They are less adapted to the hot, dry conditions than the Doricus gazelle, which actually seems to have replaced the mountain gazelle throughout some parts of its range during the late Holocene as a period of uh, climate change and glo uh, climate warming as well. That's kind of populations still change at the time. They move away from those preferred areas and the Doricus gazelle kind of comes in and takes over. So we'll have a look at the female while we're talking about the rest. Um, these guys are a diurnal species, so they're typically awake during the day and sleep during the night, and they're also quite territorial with their herds, but they typically stay in herds about three to eight individuals. The three main groups of these guys, you typically find maternity herds, um, bachelor male herds, and territorial so uh, solitary males. So in terms of their survival reproduction, these guys in the wild really survive past year eight, but they can live up to 15 years in captivity. And by 12 months uh, of age, these guys can begin breeding, as we have a look at these cute little babies here. For males, it's about 18 months. They're polygamous, and they do not spend their lives with uh, one of not spending their lives with an individual, uh, and the mountain gazelles typically breed during the early winter months. Uh, females will give birth to one offspring per year between the months of April and May. And a few days prior to giving birth, the mother will leave the herd and live in solitary for a while. For up to two months, the mother and offspring will stay by themselves while the mother watches us out for predators. And common predators of these guys will include foxes, jackals, wolves, and um, things like that. It'll try and take the fawns. And while young males will stay uh, with their mother for only six months before departing, the young females will sometimes join their mother with a herd. So in terms of food, these guys, uh, grasses and shrubs are typically the most common food for these guys, uh, quite like those grasses and stuff, and it often depends on their environment, and their range coincidentally um, coincides closely with those vacation trees that grow in these area. It also varies food availability in the region. They're mainly a grazing species, so this varies depending on the food availability. They can also survive long periods of time without a, a water source, uh, instead they acquire the fresh water they need from succulents and dew droplets from plants so they're quite well adapted to deserts in that regard so historically in 1985 there was a large population built up into israeli reserves in the southern gulan heights and ramat yishikar i believe you say that but they were decimated by foot and mouth disease and there's plans to kind of uh, prevent that happening again. But in terms of conservation, these guys were hunted throughout Israel because they were thought of a, as a pest until like 1993. The numbers are still low for multiple reasons because they face predation from jackals. They also play uh, suffer from poachers from their skin, meats and horns. Other than animals, they also get um, caught in road accidents, habitat destruction and habitat degradation and fragmentation. They're now, but they're luckily now legally protected, and often that. But sadly, it's not enough to um, just say they're protected. They need to be enforcement to protect the species, and all their range is what's extensive. Israel is pretty much the only country where the gazelle is now um, extent. And the, in 1985, the population was estimated to be about 10,000, and now it's only shrunk. In 2016, has been de declined to about two and a half thousand, and the mountain gazelle is being bred in Jerusalem, luckily in Gazelle Valley. Uh, and bred for release so luckily they are there are conservation projects trying to work on them and they are legally protected it's just they need a little bit of help but still really really wonderful animals of course i really do like mountain uh, gazelles uh, again done by leaf and mega game and rex so next we've got another gazelle this one was done by our favorite jen so leaf and jen um uh, another gazelle one of wonderful mod they've been making so we've got here the dharma gazelle also known as the Ada gazelle or the Menor gazelle, these guys are a type of gazelle that live in the Sahara Desert and the Sahil. They're critically endangered though, and have disappeared from most of their range. They're considered critically endangered, sadly, due to overhunting and habitat loss, and natural populations only remain in Chad, Mali, and Niger. And the habitats they typically survive in are semi-deserts, open savannas, scrublands, and mountain plateaus, where their diets include grasses, leaves, shoots, and fruits. A lot of variety there. So... In terms of the description, you can see they've got a quite distinctive color to them. They're um, typically a tannish, uh, reddish brown head and neck with a white uh, body. And um, they typically have these S-shaped horns that are kind of medium sized. And they have this large eyes and a narrow muzzle. They typically get between 90 and 95 centimeters tall or 35 to 37 inches at the shoulder. And they typically weigh between 35 and 75 kilograms or 77 to 165 pounds and have a lifespan of about 12 years or so in the wild and 18 in captivity. So a few days after being uh, born, the young Dharma are small enough to kind of follow the herd, as you can see here, being able to run around pretty easily, as you can see, pretty cute. 
And the Dama gazelle is considered the largest species of gazelle with long legs, which provide extra surface area to dissipate the heat and one of the many ways it stays cool in its environment. They have also tend to need more water than some of its desert relatives, but they can withstand fairly long droughts, which is pretty cool. And um, they're also a donal species, so they t typically are active during the day. And when alert, they use a uh, when alerted, um, they use a behavior called pronking to warn herd members of their danger, which involves the animal hopping up and down in all forms uh, with its legs stiff, so that the limbs all leap to look round at the same time. And males will establish territories during the breeding season. Uh, they actively exclude mature males in the breeding season, and they mark their territories with the urine and secretions from their glands near their eyes. So they're also divided into three subspecies. This subspecies here is the... Um, kind of um, Rufocolis, as if you say that. These guys are typically um, present in captive breeding programs in Europe, North Africa, and North America in the Middle East, but they're very rare in the wild. There's also um, M. Dharma Manure, which is kind of a, it's a variant of the mod that shows it, but the main difference is that they're much more reddish. They typically have reddish, typically all around here, down their leg and around their back, they're typically much more reddish. They're also um, extinct in the wild. But they're present in captive breeding programs around the world and yeah but its numbers have typically fallen about over 80 percent of the past decade and the wild population is estimated to be less than 500 uh, but there are um, a lot in captivity luckily they often occur in poor countries where the action is taken to protect the species being not well guarded etc etc they have been extirpated from morocco um, Nigeria, Libya, and Mauritania, how you say that? But populations do re uh, remain in Chad, uh, Mali, and Niger, and have been reintroduced into Sengal and Tunisia, which is pretty awesome. So in terms of threats, they do not really need a lot of water, but they need more than others, so they can be particularly affected by particularly harsh dry spells in their range. But human threats include stuff like habitat destruction, uh, human threats also um, hunting, uh, obviously for sport and for food, Tourists getting too close to them can sometimes uh, spread diseases or potentially get themselves hurt, um, things like that. Um, but luckily, there are lots of conservation e efforts in place to protect these gazelles. Uh, a few measures have been taken at reserves so they can live peacefully, and there's lots of captive breeding programs to help breed these populations up to make sure they're happy and healthy. Um, let's have a look at a female more. Walking around. Really, really awesome. So there's lots of captive breeding programs that they sadly inbred, but luckily they are doing okay in captivity. And there have been some reintroductions into places such as Morocco, things like that. And um, with some being having telemetry like collars put on so people can find where they are, where the conservationists can. But sadly, in some areas, they've been killed by wild uh, domestic dogs and near military outposts and other things like that, which they means they don't really recognize predators anymore. Though even though the goodwill is there, sometimes helping them survive is a little hard, but hopefully people persevere and we start to get healthy populations of Dharma gazelles back in their wild where they're supposed to be. But yeah, really, really awesome. You can see this cute little baby here. We definitely need more of these in the wild. Really, really beautiful little guys here. Big, big fan. So next, we're going to move it on. This is done by Jen and Genora Pizza, actually. Uh, um, it's not uh, Leaf. Genora Pizza coded this one, not Leaf. Got to make sure of that. And But Jen obviously made it, and it looks wonderful, of course. So next, moving on to another cool little guy. This guy was done by Leaf and Monsoon. We've got the Reeves Munchak, a really cool little guy here. How can you not love him? So let's have a look. This is probably the male here. Look at these wonderful guys. So this is the Reeves Muschak, also known as the Chinese Muschak. Uh, these guys are found widely throughout southeastern China and Taiwan, but have been introduced into Belgium, Netherlands, the UK, and the Republic of Ireland, also Japan as well. And they typically get the name from John Reeves, which was a naturalist that was um, employed by the British East Asian uh, East Indian Company in the um, 19th uh, century. So these guys typically grow about half a meter or one feet eight inches at the shoulder and about 0 0.95 or three feet one inch in length and they have a short tail that's about four centimeters or so so they're not the biggest but they are definitely cool they typically get between 10 and 18 kilograms when they are full grown and this reddish brown appearance that they've got on here with the stripes on the face and things like that they've got a creamy white belly as well 
and um, lighter fur extending near the um, chair and the underside of the neck and things like that. They also have quite short antlers as you kind of see here, typically about four inches or 10 centimeters in length. And they have these long upper canines uh, that are about two centimeters or two inches or five centimeters long, which they use for fighting. And um, females will also have bony lumps on their foreheads and localized uh, black spots, as you can kind of see here. Really, really awesome there. You can see the difference between the males and females. And um, yeah, in terms of Euro in Europe, they're considered endangered. As they've mentioned, they're introduced in the Netherlands, UK, Ireland, places like that. And they cannot be imported and bred. But their behavior is typically, these guys feed on herbs and blossoms, uh, fungi, grasses, nuts, things like that, and even tree bark. They'll also reportedly eat carrion when it's uh, got an opportunity. And they're typically also called the barking deer because they have quite a distinct barking sound that they make. And is, um, but though the name is also used for other species of mudjacks. Uh, the barking sound is common during mating or when provoked. And their typical habitat is typically like uh, forests and scrublands. And they're also solitary and crepuscular animals. So that means they come out during dawn and dusk. With both male and females defending small territories where they mark with their preorbital gland secretion. So a little gland under the eyes there. Um, and it's thought to be a pheromone that they use to kind of mark their territories. And when fighting, the males will use their antlers to kind of push away um, enemies and things like that. And uh, they can also wound them with their large canines. As you kind of see here, that's what they use also for fighting. So female munchjacks, also known as does, they become sexually mature in their first year of life and mating occurs throughout the year. The gestation period lasts for about 209 to 220 days, where females uh, limit the number of mating bouts through time uh, between successive bouts and, and demonstrated by males, so the bucks. So they typically fight each other for, obviously, things like that. Um, they are considered least concerned, but they are um, some inter uh, protected species in areas, and they're less least concerned because they're quite widespread and common. Though they are often notable because their tan skin is quite soft and is occasionally used for beauty products and stuff like that. And low-fat munchak meat has also been uh, noted to be quite pal palatable, so quite good food. But yeah, really, really awesome nice munchak here. Monsoon really did a wonderful job with these little uh, cool little munchak. I'm a big, big fan. Really, really awesome. So next we're moving on to something big, as you can see here. Uh, more extinct animals this time. We've got here the... Um, Extinct Gompothea anicurus. So we have a look at the big male here. So anicurus, uh, these guys are a type of elephantoid proboscidean. So this is the Gompothea. These, uh, the genus itself was native to Afro-Eurasia, so they can be found across Africa into Europe and Asia, where they lived from the late Miocene until the early Pleistocene. So their temporal range is about 8.5 to about 2 million years ago. And the type genus of the family was named by um, Augustin Amard in 1855. And they were traditionally um, considered to be a Gompothea, but they were later assigned to the family Elephantidae. So they are related to elephants. And though they have a subfamily within Gompotheridae, things like that. But recently they've also been uh, put out with um, other Gompotheas, so Tetraphanodont Gompotheas, but are now regarded as Elephantoidea, so they are closely related. Um, they're typically not too distinct from that, so they stood about three meters tall and weighed up to five tons and looked quite similar as you can see here to your typical modern elephant. And aside from having somewhat shorter legs, they were quite um, different because they had much longer tusks than um, your typical African or Asian elephant. And actually considered to have the longest tusks out of any elephants. So these tusks were got up to about four meters or 13 feet in length, and they were typically... Um, potentially used for weapons and um, for digging and things like that. Very similar to how elephants will use their tusks today. And then molars were not composed of laminae like two elephants, but they had cusps that were kind of like tapir and pig molars. And it seems like they may have lived in forests and stuff like that. They eat it from eat from trees, shrubs, and dig out tubers and roots on the forest floor. And they died out when these habitats during the Pleistocene became more grasslands. And stable isotopes from Ethiopian Anacurus uh, from enamel about three to four million years ago suggests that it also grazed on plants, so that potentially might not be a biggest cause as we think. But let's have a look at the females while we're talking about them. Look at how cute these guys are. Really, really awesome. So uh, the oldest known species is a Promiscius, which was found in the uh, Pakistan about eight and a half million years ago. The species depicted here is the latest species. So this species is um, Anacurus avirimnensis, 
which was the last surviving species and went extinct during the early Pleistocene, about 2 million years ago. So this was um, when it was kind of, Europe was a lot warmer than it was today, so with lots of forests and stuff around the place. So um, dental microwear analysis also suggests that these guys were browsers, so they typically feed on barks, uh, seeds and stuff like that, and potentially went extinct when most of these food resources uh, went away during the ice age as the world became drier and typically forests gave away to grasslands but yeah still really really awesome species here really cool to talk about them so yeah now we're coming up soon and we've got some little bit more to do so next we've got a couple gibbons i really like talking about these cool gibbons here so next we've got the pileated gibbon by mega kebab so how can you not love talking about these cool gibbons so let's look at the mail here so let's even get it. there we are so the pileated gibbon is a pi uh, primate found in obviously the gibbon family. These guys have sexual dimorphism with fur, and the males have typically have this black fur as you can kind of see here, um, while the females have a white grey coloured fur that only, only in the and the only the belly and hands are black. And the white and often shaggy uh, hair has a ring about it, and that's common in both sexes. So quite interesting animals here. They're typically in, um, considered endangered uh, by I, um, IUCN, and their main threats are like most other species living in Southeast Asia's habitat destruction, with wild forests being converted into farmland and are locally extinct in a lot of areas. They're also caught for pets and other wildlife smuggling attempts uh, as meat and also pets and sold in wildlife smuggling, which is really sad, which affects their populations, then that's why they're considered endangered. So the range of these guys typically is eastern Thailand, western Cambodia, and southwestern Laos. And the lifetime is much like the other gibbons, is kind of diurnal and arboreal. So they like climbing around and uh, brachiating and uh, swinging around in the trees. So let's have a look at the females while we're talking about them. So really awesome pileated gibbon. Look how funny these guys are. I really do love these guys. So um, they live together in monogamous pairs where they brachiate or use their arms to climb around the trees with their long arms, and then they predominantly eat fruits, leaves, and small animals. Uh, reproduction habita uh, habits are not well known for the Pileated Gibbon, but it's suggested that they're more similar to other gibbons in that regard. And mating pairs will typically mark their own territories together, where they use these loud calls that they're making now to um, kind of establish themselves. And um, their populations are believed to be about 35,000 individuals in Cambodia and about 30,000 in Thailand, so they're quite a lot. But um, because of the threats, as I mentioned, um, stuff like uh, catching them for the wildlife trade and habitat destruction, they have are put as endangered. But luckily, there are non-profit groups that are kind of take uh, gibbons that have been um, caught for the pet trade or also displaced by habitat destruction. They often will rehabilitate and release them into areas that are safe. So that's really, really cool. And they've done a good job of that. So really helping these gibbons. And I just got to say, they're really, really cool. And you can see them break yet there. How wonderful. I do like a pileated gibbon. Uh, again, done by Mega Kebab, who also did our next gibbon. We have got here the uh, Southern Yellow Crested Gibbon. Another really cool animal here. So as you can kind of see, they get their name because of that yellow, um, yellow cheeked gibbon, I mean. So they're also known as the Golden Cheeked Gibbon or the Golden Cheeked Crested Gibbon or the Buffed Cheeked Gibbon. These guys are native to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And they were discovered and named by the British naturalist um, Grabiel Maud Vassil, I believe you say that. So the white uh, crested gibbon is born kind of blonde. Let's see if we can find the baby. They're born blonde. There's got to be a baby in here. I can't find it. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, is that a baby? No, that's a poop. No, no, no. We won't worry about that. So, um... The yellow crests are given, they're kind of born blonde and then later turn black, with males coloring this color throughout their um, lifespan. And they have these distinctive yellow cheeks, as you kind of see here, or golden cheeks. But females are typically born blonde and then bled into the mother's fur and they later turn black. Females turn black into blonde after sexual maturity and only have a black cap on the top of their heads, as you can kind of see here as she's hanging out like that. Really, really beautiful. So there's not actually much known about this species, but it's thought to have a lifespan of approximately 46 years or so. And the gibbons will um, vocalize and they climb around. They're very similar ecology to siamangs and pileated gibbons. They climb around, uh, mark territories with their sounds. They will feed on fruits, things like that, and have coordinated songs to defend their territories. 
So the largest known population is in the Cambodia Kyo Senon Wildlife Sanctuary, which has an estimated 1,400 individuals as of 2020. And there are several conservation programs active in this site and also other areas trying to help these populations of gibbons and protect them from uh, habitat destruction and the wildlife trade and so they can get bigger and better and obviously um, recover. Oh, there's the baby gibbons. So that wasn't a poop. Look at these really cute little guys. This is a little uh, female here, you can see. They've got the wonderful colors there. So Mega Gabab has really done a wonderful job with these cool little gibbons, giving us a lot of cool variety with um, the Siamang. And now we've got the La Gibbon, we've got the Pelleated Gibbon, uh, the Siamang, and the um, Southern White Cheek Gibbon. A uh, Yellow Cheek Gibbon, I mean. But yeah, really, really awesome. So um, again, done by Mega Gabab. Last but not least, we've got a marine mammal. Uh, we do love a marine mammal. It's a very famous one. We've got the Common Bottlenose Dolphin, done by Leaf... Jen and Buffsu by uh, for the Aquaria pack. So really, really awesome here. So let's have a look at these guys. So this is the bottlenose dolphin. Uh, the common bottlenose dolphin uh, is a wide-ranging mammal that's pretty much found across the world. Uh, they're quite famous for being uh, caught and um, have wide exposure due to being in captivity and dolphinariums, also being in a lot of TV show programs and such. But these guys typically live in tropical, uh, tropical and temperate waters across the world, being absent only from polar waters. Though, in terms of their anatomy and uh, genetics, it seems there may be more species within um, what we consider now the common bottlenose dolphin. Uh, there already has been the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin split from that, and there potentially may be other species recognized because they have considerable genetic variation and physical variation between them. So there could be more species of bottlenose dolphin within them. Yeah, really, really awesome animal here. Let's see if we can get one swimming around. I want to get one swimming around because they are so awesome. Really, really beautiful. So... These guys are typically grey in colour and they can get between 2 to 4 metres or 6 to 13 feet long and weigh between 150 and 650 kilograms or 330 to 1430 pounds. Uh, males are generally larger and heavier than the females and in most parts of the world's uh, adult length is about 2.5 to 3.5 metres or 8 to, uh, to 11 feet and weigh between 200 and 500 kilograms or about 400 to 1100 pounds. And you can see they typically have a short but well-developed snout that kind of looks like a gin bottle, where they get the name the bottle nose. And like other whales and dolphins, they do not have a true snout, and their nose has evolved into a blowhole here, as you can see up here, which they often uh, basically breathe by using a big sneeze. So they expel all the oxygen out from their blowhole in one big sneeze, and then kind of take in as many breaths as possible so they can hold their breath when they dive. So, where's another? There's got to be some more around here. Here it is, one summon. Really, really beautiful um, model here as well. So, these guys also have fused vertebrae, like other dolphins. Um, but they're typically more flexible since not all of them are fused. Only five of them are uh, not fused. So that allows them to be a little bit more flexible with their heads. They're also quite intelligent with large brains. Uh, they've been uh, shown to be quite socially intelligent. They have an artificial language. Uh, they can mimic. They can characterize objects and also recognize themselves in mirrors, which is um, the ways of really testing their intelligence. They can be very, very smart. And um, in terms of their ecology and behavior, they're a very social species and tend to live in groups called pods. And they typically number about 15 individuals. But pairs, uh, but the group size can vary from just pairs of dolphins to over a hundred or even thousand individuals for short periods of time. And these types of like nursery groups, uh, juvenile groups, and groups of adult males, there's lots of variation within that. In terms of the diet, these guys will typically eat eels, squids, and shrimp, also a wide variety of fish. They do not chew their food and also swallow it whole. And these guys will often work together to um, hunt them as they use coordinated attacks. Some populations that live on coasts, they will funnel them near the shore and kind of use mud to paddle them and kind of create kind of mud nets or sand nets to catch prey. And then they will drive them onto the shore and then reach out on the shore and then slide back into the water and grab their food which is pretty cool and like other species of whale they have echolocation from this large melon that they have which is a fat um, a kind of a fatty organ that they have on their heads that amplifies sound so they can uh, use the sound to kind of pinpoint prey and use that instead of using their sight which is very effective for these guys and also use them to communicate Depending on where they live, they have a wide variety of different food things. In populations of the U.S. Atlantic coast, they'll eat uh, perch and um, 
eels and stuff like that it really just depends where you are they'll eat pretty much anything as long as it's not too big for them and they can hunt together they're also quite um social and good communicators so they will um typically communicate by lots of squeaks that are emitted from their blowholes also uh, whistles and uh, from their nasal sacs and then um below the blowhole and they also they'll communicate with other different types of body language and stuff like that so they're very very social and able to communicate very well with other members of their group their head as you can see the melon has also got an acoustic lens that they use to protect the brain case as well and they use that to communicate they also will emit cl uh, clicking sounds and listen for the echoes to try and find potential prey and potentially other things and nearby objects things like that so that's what they typically use to kind of find their way around the world and communicate with each other quite a vocal species and use that to communicate uh in terms of reproduction we'll have a look at the cute little baby dolphins as we talk about these so look at this cute little guy here so typically uh mating uh for these dolphins is polygamous so that although they can breed throughout the year they mostly breed in spring uh males will form alliances to seek out a female in estrus and for a chance to mate with the female the males will separate her from her home range and then the female will bear a calf every three to six years Typically, after a year-long gestation, the female will give birth to a single calf, with a newborn calf being about 0.8 to 1.4 meters, or 2 foot 7 to 4 foot 7 in length, and weighing between 15 and 30 kilograms, or 33 to 66 pounds. And the calf will suckle for about 18 to 20 months, and then sexual maturity after its weans, they become sexually mature at about um, 5 to 14 years of age, depends on the population with um, sexual maturity usually occurring between 8 to 13 years for males and 5 to 10 years for females. And in terms of the lifespan, they're quite a long lived species. They can live for about 40 to 50 years. Really quite long lived. Um, let's see if we can get you guys diving. I want to see you dive. Are you going to dive for me? Come on, dive for me. I'm going to go for food. They probably are. All right. We'll just find another one swimming around. Got to be another one swimming around. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In terms of their distribution, these guys are typically found in trip, uh, temperate, subtropical, and tropical oceans all across the world. The global population is estimated to be about 600,000. And there's many different populations. Some will live more inshore, closer to shores, and then some will live further offshore, or, and they're typically called inshore, offshore populations. Typically, these offshore populations are larger and darker and potentially uh, smaller fins and beaks than the inshore populations. But offshore populations are quite migratory. They can migrate up to 4,200 kilometers in a season. But inshore populations tend to move um, less, though some will move in different migrations, things like that. Uh, in terms of El Nino events and potentially move in different areas to find food. That really just depends on the local population, things like that. Coastal dolphins actually appear to adapt to warm, shallow waters by having a smaller body and larger fins to help them move better and help distribute heat uh, a little better as well, which is pretty cool. And um, they can be found in estuaries, lagoons, harbors, and bays, though offshore dolphins tend to be adapted for cooler, deeper waters. And certain qualities of their blood actually suggest that these offshore dolphins are actually more adapted to dive, deep diving, which is pretty cool. And they also consider large, uh, considering larger body protects them from most predators and also helps them retain body heat. Well, these guys are kind of going for a feed as well. Not the best timing, eh? Anyway, we'll just wait for them to do their thing. Um, We'll talk about human interactions as well. These guys are quite common uh, in the uh, the most common dolphin typically you find in zoos and aquariums. Um, so these guys will most commonly be found if you go to an aquarium and they have dolphins, you most likely be seeing a bottlenose dolphin or a common bottlenose at least. So let's see if we can find one swimming around here. Here we are. Sorry for a bit of a... It's just the dolphins being dolphins. They're not really playing ball. But anyway, uh, they're typically found in uh, multiple countries. So they can be found... And they're hunted for food annually in the Faroe Islands and in Taiji. But they're also sometimes caught as a bycatch from tuna fishing. Though generally whaling for these guys is becoming out of practice, of course. And there's lots of famous individual bottlenose dolphins like um, Flipper, things like that. Winter, who was one that had her... She was rescued without a, a tail. I think her tail was amputated. 
or she was just deformed and then they managed to give her a fluke as like a prosthetic that's a rather cool little story in terms of their conservation though they seem to be some populations such as the black sea north sea baltic and mediterranean populations are kind of considered under apex to, uh, two are the um cites and they are protected in some areas because some populations are kind of a bit smaller than others depends where you are though they are generally more than a few thousand different populations things like that but they are often affected by things such as bycatch as i mentioned they can get caught in um, nets that are specifically made for tuna uh, and plus i like spouting the fact that for every pound of fish that you get you get about five pounds of bycatch so it's very not efficient and it can kill a lot of dolphins but also things like marine pollution as things such as oil spills and also mercury because these guys are apex predators a lot of the stuff from the bottom of the food chain uh, accumulates in them so these guys can be quite toxic uh, to eat sometimes because they've got a lot of mercury in their um bodies and that can affect things like the endocrine system so they have a harder time breeding and it really affects their populations but um luckily as i mentioned they're quite widespread and doing quite well uh, we just need to solve those issues um and that's obviously something that a lot of people are working towards people really do love bottlenose dolphins they're very quite a charismatic and awesome species definitely a big fan really do love them so um yeah we'll get to see you guys swimming around how beautiful are you let's see if you can find a little baby swimming around and use to talk about them i just want to spot the little baby where's the little baby it's a little baby right there and how cute are you aren't you adorable adorable little baby dolphin but um yeah anyway so thanks to everyone who made these mods uh really love seeing a lot more cool just interesting animals coming like the gibbons and dolphins and really just love all these species so um yeah i uh really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything so yeah hopefully you guys enjoy this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye